Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Welcome back, Adapters. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. This podcast is your voice and platform to talk about climate change. On today's episode, I have two icons of the environmental movement, Dennis Hayes, co-founder of the original Earth Day, and Bill McKibben, founder of 350.org and legendary climate activist. I have to say this episode is bittersweet for me, though. Even though I'm so excited to share these conversations with you, I'm recording this on the same day President Trump signed his executive order to roll back the climate change rules established under President Obama. He also rolled back the Climate Action Plan, which was dedicating money toward adaptation in local communities. Folks, if I may quote Vice President Biden, this is a big fucking deal and not in a good way. These are very serious times. The president is living up to the very worst stereotype many of us had of him. That's why I think this episode is so important. First off, Dennis Hayes, as I said, the co-founder of the original Earth Day, talks about that event. But he also shares about what we can do today to keep up this tradition of activism. And then Bill McKibben comes on to share a very sobering and yet ultimately hopeful message that we can do something. I hope their words inspire you to take action. The Climate Change March is coming up April 29th. Get involved. Their passion to undo these climate laws is a pale shadow to the passion in all of you to take action on climate change. Remember, President Trump's views don't represent the majority of the people in this country. For this podcast, I'm committed to bringing on guests to keep climate change front and center going forward. Please share your ideas for guests. Communicate with me. Before we get started, I want to mention next week I have on Judge Alice Hill, the former senior director of adaptation on the National Security Council under President Obama. So I want to jump right into this episode, but please stick around until the end to learn a bit more about what's going on with the podcast. I hope this episode inspires you to take action. After talking with Dennis and Bill, I know I was inspired. Hi, adapters. On today's show, I have Dennis Hayes, the principal national organizer of the very first Earth Day in 1970. Dennis is currently the president of the Bullet Foundation, and I could go on, but I would just be scratching the surface on Dennis's influence on the modern environmental movement. So we're going to just jump right in. Thank you so much, and welcome to the podcast, Dennis. Well, thanks for that great introduction, Doug. Nice to be here. Looking at some of my guests, their their backgrounds, it's very intimidating. I, I'm I'm truly honored to have you on. And so today I want to cover three topics. Earth Day, which I'm sure you've talked a lot about, but people want to hear from you on these topics. I actually want to talk about the Bullet Foundation for a bit and then the Earth Optimism Summit. So I hope you feel ready to talk about those three things. Uh, sure. Let's give it a shot. All right. I'm going to jump right into Earth Day. We're coming up on Earth Day, and you personally have seen a tremendous amount of environmental history unfold. And so I just got a simple question for you. How are we doing? <laughs> um, well, we're probably doing better in some ways than most people realize. But in the grand scheme of things, I'm afraid that the, the drift is in the wrong direction. It's the old standard. We've, we've been winning a lot of battles, and the war has been drifting in the wrong direction. People forget that in the 1960s, the air over Pittsburgh or Gary, Indiana or Los Angeles was very much like the air is in Shenzhen or Shanghai or New Delhi today. Uh, just breathtaking changes between then and now. We had lakes and rivers that were unswimmable and unfishable and in which you can now swim and, and eat the fish that comes out of them. The Great Lakes were dying and they were still in trouble, but we're restoring them slowly to health. And, and, and I could go on and on. We had the bald eagle. Our national emblem was on the endangered. There was no endangered species list, but it was an endangered species then. And in the immediate aftermath of Earth Day, the next seven, eight, nine years, we passed a few dozen uh, important laws that have caused uh, dramatic changes in the way that America does business. And by and large, that's been good for the environment. But the war, uh, that's to say the big international issues, uh, the, the existential one now being climate change, but ocean acidification, particularly migratory species that you can't save in one small ecosystem. You've got to somehow provide protection over migratory routes that may stretch thousands and thousands of miles. Uh, the continued growth of the human population, even as we aspire to higher and higher levels of affluence and the pollution that that creates and the resource depletion, those things are all in arguably much worse shape today than they were in 1970. 
curious. So this podcast is about climate change, and it's mainly about adapting to climate change, but I have people come on and talk about the science. But I'm curious, at that first Earth Day, did it come up in any sort of shape or form? I mean, was there any mention of climate change or global warming? Um, you know, there, there were thousands of events across the country, and I, I, I probably should not on a podcast say that nobody said a word about it because somebody out there may find out that someplace somebody did. But but there's certainly, you know, we, we've known about the theoretical basis of carbon dioxide warming in the atmosphere for a couple hundred years. It was not on anybody's agenda as a priority in 1970. And in fact, there was in the early 1970s a, a, a group of pretty distinguished scientists at uh, University of California at Berkeley that were promoting an ice ball earth theory that we were actually moving into a new period where the earth might move into massive glaciation it would be a global cooling. It wasn't until the late 1970s that there began to emerge on the part of a number of uh, climate scientists. Still, I wouldn't quite say a consensus, but but a, a strong perception that, in fact, the principal drift was toward warming. Uh, I, what I was running the in, in the Carter administration, the Federal Solar Energy Research Institute, and just a few miles down the road from there was the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And the guy who was running the National Climate Assessment for them became a, a, a pretty close friend of mine. And in the course of a number of long walks, he convinced me that, that this was a real issue in 1979. And in fact, I gave a, a keynote address to the American Association for the Advancement of Science on solar energy, but with the rationales there for the first time, not just being imported oil from the Middle East and national security and balance of payments, but actually talked about climate change. And that was the most controversial thing in the talk. Everything else people accepted. Climate change as late as 1980 was was not a consensus. I guess the issue about the political environment at the time, and I'm just curious, I know it's kind of hard to look back or even speculate, but imagine what we know now about climate change, where the science is at, the warming that we've seen, and had that sort of that same situation come up like in 1969, 1970. How do you think that would have been built into that first Earth Day? It would have been an important element. I mean, the it's easiest to to organize people and to get them um, motivated to actually do something when something is an immediate threat to themselves or to their children or to their neighborhoods or their community and, and even their nation. The, the more global something is, uh, the more difficult it is to get action. So I'm, I'm guessing that there still would have been uh, a lot of the same events that we had that we're talking about in air pollution and water pollution and endangered species. But it turns out that a lot of the things that people were talking about, uh, which was the sulfur dioxide, for example, that came out of power plants and the nitrogen oxides that were coming out of automobile tailpipes, uh, we would have just had to add carbon dioxide to both of those things. You do precisely the same event, but it then would have had a, a, a global warming aspect to it. I mean, the, the, the thing that was different in 1970 and why in an alternative reality, I wish we had known more about this issue then, is that in 1970, uh, this the environment was still a fairly bipartisan issue. Uh, Richard Nixon had not yet completed the Southern strategy where he sort of dumped the liberal Republicans from New England and even some in the Midwest and the far West in order to get a solidly Republican bloc that he stole away from the Democrats after the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and transformed America into a much more polarized society. Uh, but back in 1970, people still paid attention to science. Uh, they paid attention to facts. If you made a, a compelling argument, it didn't just run into the shoals on one side of the aisle because it had been advanced by a president from the other side of the aisle. Uh, I, I don't want to paint this as uh, a, a perfect political environment, and it was enormously frustrating in a great many ways, but Compared to 2017, it was actually pretty good. That, that was my next question. And as I was preparing to talk with you, uh, it, it occurred to me that the timing of climate change has really been terrible for us. And it, it's like you're saying, had we seen like in the last 15 years, we have just seen many of the impacts and we're seeing the ice melting. And so 
Had the timing of all that been closer to when you were organizing that first Earth Day, would we have really gotten a robust response? And it's just, I mean, you don't control these things, but climate change really reared its ugly head. And the timing wasn't good. Yeah. No, without a doubt, that's correct. There was another perturbation. We are all now fixated on Trump. But the first of these perturbations was really Ronald Reagan. Jimmy Carter's approach to energy, which was not perfect, but it, it had a number of strong points, was driven in very large measure by a desire not to be dependent upon Middle Eastern oil and uh, to reduce air pollution and to reduce the flood of our money going to the Middle East and what that was doing to our balance of payments. But within it, he called for a goal of getting 20% of the nation's energy from renewable sources by the year 2000. And my institution had $2 million from the Department of Energy, which in today's dollars is probably 6 or $7 million to spend on a detailed study involving the other national laboratories and, and a half a dozen principal research universities to map out how to get there. And by the end of the Carter administration, we had a, this plan which would have dramatically increased the efficiency with which the American society operated, buildings, transportation, and industry, and then of the residue gotten easily, we believe, at, at least uh, 20%. And, and actually, we found that with the right incentives, we could have gotten as much as 25% of all the nation's energy from renewables by the year 2000. So without climate even being an important driver behind that, we would have, I mean, if, if that had happened, then by today, we would probably be 45 or 50% renewable. And climate change, instead of being an existential issue, uh, would, would be a relatively back burner issue. And America would be exporting the technologies that we had developed back in those periods to the rest of the world instead of importing them as we are today. Because when Ronald Reagan came in, in, in addition to symbolically ripping the solar collectors off the roof of the White House, which is what everybody knows, he also reduced my budget by 80 percent, fired 40 percent of my staff fired 100% of our contractors from the major research institutes in the country, including two that went on to win Nobel Prizes later. I mean, it was just a catastrophe. So even if we had known about climate change, then I'm not sure that by the time you got to 1980, we wouldn't have run into the same ideological opposition. I, I always tried to figure out exactly why a conservative president who kept talking about states' rights and individual responsibilities would be opposed to distributed energy sources. and uh, I've never come up with an intellectual reason, but I think it's he sitting down with his domestic advisor, Ed Meese, and his secretary of energy, Jim Edwards, neither of whom knew anything about the subject, and basically discussing, so do we want to have Ed Teller's energy source or do we want to have Jane Fonda's energy source? And wow. On that sort of basis, just wiped out um, the technologies that this country had pioneered for the previous dozen years. Well, that's a good point. I think historians will look back at, you know, they talk about trajectories of carbon. And like you just described, the early 1980s could have been that trajectory of really lowering that carbon footprint. And yet it's going to be a lost generation. Yeah. No, if, if you look at the budget of what is now called the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and keep it in constant dollars, taking out inflation, uh, we did not return to the budget that we had at the last year of the Carter administration again until no, what was it? I think about 2008. So in essence, we lost about three decades. <laughs> On that note, I wanted one more question about the history of Earth Day, and I was very curious, is that when Republicans talk about environmentalism, you know, first of all, they, sometimes they have to go all the way back to Theodore Roosevelt, which I think is quite absurd. But Nixon is brought up a lot, and you'd mentioned the sort of the times when there was Republicans who were more interested in working environmental issues. But at the time when all those major pieces of legislation passed i know nixon signed them but did did he does he really get credit or was it sort of something that was going to happen anyway where there's super majorities should he get credit for being an environmental president well first let me say that that beyond nixon there were a number of strong ardent uh republicans at that point who were pro-civil rights mm -hmm. and, and who were pro getting out of the war in vietnam and who were aggressively pro-environment uh, Richard Nixon was was not one of them. Uh, and in fact, on, on a few occasions, he would be muttering things like real Americans don't whine because they got a little grit in their teeth. And America did not conserve itself to greatness. And, 
Uh, but but if he wasn't much of an environmentalist, he was a he was a very good politician, and he was in this somewhat perilous transitional period where it, it's almost the domestic equivalent of his going to China, where he decided to to go after what had been a solidly democratic South. And, and today we tend to think of the Democratic Party as the more progressive party and the Republican Party as a conservative or regressive party. Uh, but in, in 1960s, and until the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, the Democratic Party's strength in Washington, D.C., grew out of a series of committee chairs and, and absolutely deliverable votes from a segregated South that was just terrible on a whole bunch of issues. Nixon realized that after Lyndon Johnson pushed through those civil rights measures that the South was up for grabs and he went out to grab them. At the same time, he didn't want to lose all the progressives. in it. I mean, the, you know, the first African-American senator, reasonably progressive one, post-Reconstruction was Ed Brooks, a Republican out of Massachusetts. Uh, we had just person after person. Pete McCloskey, who was just an ardent good guy. John Lindsay, who was a real threat to Nixon as a potential presidential candidate as the mayor of New York. So on, on Earth Day, Nixon's glancing out. We've got this huge crowd on the mall in Washington, D.C. He turns on the television set and there's estimates of more than a million people in New York City and John Lindsay giving a speech from the top of this gigantic stage. And, and he realizes that, uh, you know, this environment thing seems to have some legs underneath it. Uh, and according to John Ehrlichman, who was his chief domestic advisor, who then got caught up in Watergate and was sent to the slammer. When he got out, uh, his son or one of his sons was a paralegal who worked for me at that time and um, stopped by to visit his son. We all went out for dinner and his version of, of this, which is a little bit self-serving, but I, I tend to believe it because it's in my interest to believe it, is that Ehrlichman is sitting with Nixon in the White House. They see all these things. Nixon says, what are we going to do about this? I mean, they, they might strip away a, a big part of the party. And Ehrlichman says, so you remember that study that you had Roy Ash do a few years ago? Uh, Ash was the head of Lytton Industries, and he did the study on governmental reorganization. He says he had within it an environmental protection agency. And, and the beauty of it, Dick, is, is, is you know we're, we're already doing this stuff. So you do air pollution, that's stuff that we now have in health, education, and welfare. Water pollution, that's over at Interior. Radiation, that's at the Atomic Energy Commission. Pesticides, it's at the Department of Agriculture. You just take all those programs out, you put them all together, might even save a little bit of money, call it an environmental protection agency, and all of a sudden you're a player. <laughs> and at least according to Ehrlichman, that's how a pretty anti-environmental president uh, actually, through an executive order, set up the, the first EPA in the world. Wow. Uh, and another thing, just a small point, you went through and saying Nixon signed all that legislation. He actually signed the Clean Air Act in 1970. He vetoed the Clean Water Act in okay. 1972. That went back to Congress and they overrode him with, with super, not, not just super majorities. It was like 98% in one chamber and I think a wow. voice vote in the other chamber. They just slammed Nixon. And after that, he signed every environmental bill oh, wow. that came across his desk. Interesting. So I have one more question about Earth Day for you. And the 50 year anniversary is coming up. Are, are you going to be involved with that? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting along in two. There's, there's some point where you sort of have to realize you're no longer a, a teenage radical. Uh, I, I will certainly be involved. I've, I've sort of gone to emeritus status now in helping people with fundraising and helping them line up speakers and sometimes helping open doors that were otherwise. But I, it, this is a young person's game and the leadership for pulling this together really ought to be people who are not in their 70s. I do hope you're involved in some capacity, and it sounds like you will be. And I, I, I think, especially with who will be president at the time, it'll probably be a, a really big event. And well, I, I should say the hopes for it is not that it's a really big event in the United States, but rather that we. I mean, and this this may be oh, certainly incredibly hard. The question is whether it's impossible. We'd like to get the period between Earth Day and World Environment Day, this thing that's sponsored by the United Nations. There's about a one-month gap there. And we'd like to have that as a, a whole period globally where people are wrestling with issue after issue after issue. The things that are important to people in their own countries and their own communities, and then the things that are important globally. It, it was important as recently as well, maybe 1990 to, to have a day where you focused attention on stuff and you could actually change people's minds. But with today's attention spans, um, stuff that comes and goes in 
one or two news cycles has no residual effect. And we have to somehow, I think, get environmental issues, which, which, let's face it, we're talking about the sustainability of the planet and the future of our species up there sufficiently strongly for sufficiently long that people begin to actually pay attention and, and ask, what does this mean for me and what should I be doing about it? So rather than a big day, I'm, I'm hoping we're going to have using all sorts of multimedia things and a lot of podcasts and a lot of uh, digital technologies as well, uh, have this day after day after day after day into people's minds. And hopefully, uh, if we have not done anything on climate by uh, the year 2020, uh, we will be creating the same sort of irresistible force around it by then, as the evidence just continues to pile up, that even a recalcitrant Congress will do something dramatic. Well, that sounds like an exciting approach. I hope to play a role myself with the podcast. I think that, yeah, there's roles for everybody. Dennis, um, I have a couple more areas here I want to kind of get through quickly, but you're the president and CEO of the Bullet Foundation. What is the Bullet Foundation? Uh, the Bullet Foundation is a Seattle-based environmental philanthropy that operates in a relatively narrow geographic area that we call the Emerald Corridor. It's from Portland, Oregon, west of the Cascades, up through Seattle and onto Vancouver, British Columbia. It's, it's, if you will, maybe the easiest place on the planet for somebody with our values to operate. It, it tends to have a, a population that is pretty environmentally aware, reasonably low unemployment rates. Uh, I think it's now like 3.1, 3.2% unemployment. Um, we have a relatively well-educated population. We've got areas of just scenic grandeur and great recreational opportunity. We tend mostly, not entirely, but mostly to have uh, the most exciting new commercial operations be things that are relatively light on the environment. And so what we're trying to do is, is turn this Emerald Corridor into a model of sustainability. I mean, as, as the entire world is going into urban areas, uh, we're Homo sapiens is becoming an urban species. And, and some cities are certainly dramatically better than others. We don't really have any sustainable cities on the planet right now. The, there are certainly things one can learn from Copenhagen and Freiburg and Malmo and, and the others that are out there at the edge. We, we want Seattle, Portland and Vancouver to become not only the greenest cities in North America, but a place where people are prepared to experiment fairly boldly with all of the elements of sustainability as a as it affects the built environment, transportation systems, and food systems, and recreation across the board. Well, as I was looking at your website, and I, I've in a previous position, I, I worked a bit with Wilberforce Foundation, and they focused too on the Northwest. And it, it occurred to me, you guys already got it, <laughs> and you probably wouldn't agree, but uh, I'm from the Deep South, and it's just like <laughs> spread the wealth, you know, come on, they, <laughs> they need your foundation help and. I don't know if you interact with like, you know, Turner Foundation, they're doing some good stuff down there, but the Northwest, they're covered. So anyway. Don't, don't no, in, 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 in fact, uh, if you, if you link Wilberforce and Bullet together, we become kind of a, a cool approach because uh, we spend basically all of our money where humans are living and involved and Wilberforce spends essentially oh, okay. all of its money uh, where there are few people. In fact, People sometimes say that the farther away you are from the nearest settlement, the more likely you are to get a Wilberforce grant. Hmm. So between the two of us, we, we actually do do a nice job in this part of the world. Well, just quickly, this podcast, uh, most of the guests that I have come on, they're, they're adaptation experts. And I know that some of the initiatives that you're doing, especially with the built environment, you talk about resilience and re resilient buildings and communities. And is that a, a relatively new thing? Because Adaptation is in this emerging field, and I know the the buildings, it, it, it's about your energy footprint and such, but do you feel like it's something that you're exploring even more? Because, you know, it is a different thing when you're thinking about climate change impacts, and has that altered the sort of groups that you're funding and how you approach things when you think about resilience, or have you been doing that since the beginning? Oh, well, well, clearly the drift is toward a, a greater emphasis than there was 10 years ago when basically our – attitude and, and, and broadly the attitude in the community is uh, don't even focus upon how we are going to be coping with climate change. We have to put all of our energies into avoiding it. Uh, but today we can't avoid it anymore. This, the stuff that is built into the system is going to be bringing about dramatic changes. So you have to figure out a way for us to deal with what is now inevitable. 
Uh, however, it's not inevitable that we're going to continue to get more and more and more carbon into the atmosphere until we've burned every ounce of coal in the ground. We're, we are still very much into prevention. But uh, part of the prevention is, is if, as you say, building structures, buildings, transportation systems, food systems uh, that will be more resilient in the coming climate era. Well, have you sort of set benchmarks, at least at the Bullet Foundation? I'm from Florida, and you have you know, like cities like Miami that are doing some incredible work on adaptation planning. But there are a lot of people that are saying that, okay, well, at the end of the century, you're going to be underwater anyway. And so are they not really being realistic? And are those issues kind of coming up in the Northwest? Are you, do you approach it with, we might have to let some things go, or is it, no, we can make these entire communities sustainable? Yeah, we we, we have... Some places, they tend not to be places where there were a, a lot of people now living, except some coastal communities that basically it's difficult to figure out how they would be resolved. There are some native communities uh, that are may well be doomed. Uh, but if you look at the projections, and, you know, and this is also another thing. I mean, environmentalists tend to be people who maybe it traces back to our toilet training or something, tend to be a little bit pessimistic. When you're looking at the options, that that by and large has served us well. We've generally never overstated what, how, how bad things were going to be, but we tend to take a fairly bleak view of it. You can build a decent case that given what the lag times have changed and the current consumption patterns of the world and the likely future trajectories, that, for example, uh, the Everglades may not be salvageable. I mean, well, the national environmental community has poured an enormous amount of energy and yes. money and stuff into saving the Everglades. Well, if it's all going to be basically infiltrated by salt water and killed, then maybe that's something that at some point you have to say, say, geez, that's, that's I mean, similarly historic preservation. I mean, is, is there a city that brings more unique charms and talents and culture to America than New Orleans? But is, is there, some reasonable chance right now that New Orleans is simply doomed. It's going to be one hurricane after another at various intervals, and it's just an expense that we will not be able to continue. I, it's that level of adaptation that basically says, you know, you've only got so much money. What is it that we're going to preserve, and what of it is, is absolutely lost? At the very least, uh, I, I would hope that we're going to find ourselves with enough intelligence as a species not to be having major new developments into things that are are in pretty bad shape uh, in, in terms of a 25, 50 year time horizon. I mean, Dubai, <laughs> you take a look at the artificial islands that they've built off the coast of Dubai, filled with these breathtakingly expensive condominiums. And there's, there's just simply no way that those islands are not going to be underwater before those buildings go through their life expectancy. If I could make any recommendation to a foundation and, you know, I worked for the federal government and it was very difficult for them to talk about things like plan retreat. It's just a political hot potato. And it's they're going to even have less of those conversations now with President Trump. But it seems like the foundation community, I, I don't know, maybe this is something the Bullet Foundation already does. But going out there and funding groups that are having these workshops talking about plan retreat because it's a conversation that's not happening enough. And we're not going to have if it happens more quickly than we can have control all over, you know, it'd be nice to know that there's a record of at least thinking about this. So anyway, my two cents. Yeah, no, it, it turns out that the, the particular cities that we are focused on, I mean, and as you said earlier, this is kind of a charmed part of the country. It, it, it's one of the easiest ones to work on. The Portland, Seattle and Vancouver don't have anything that looks like Miami Beach. Uh, there, there, there are some areas that if Puget Sound went up enough or if the storm increased in frequency enough, uh, you'd have to abandon it. But I, I don't think that there's anything right now that you can build the sort of case I would make with Miami Beach that you should not build another new building there because hmm. during the course of its lifetime, it's going to be uninhabitable. We, we do have areas, though, that are agricultural and silvicultural and others that, that may uh, and we probably should be putting more effort into looking at them. And, and again, smaller coastal communities. You know, the interesting thing is when you talk about this in terms of priorities and what really kind of terrifies people is that we also have uh, the Cascadia subduction zone offshore here. We're, we're going to be sometime in, in the same kind of time horizon we're talking about formidable climate change. 
uh, having an earthquake that's going to be 9.2, 9.3, wow. 9.4, uh, massive tsunamis. The last time that they had one of these things, there were no white people here and nobody went. But, but native lore was of uh, uh, finding whales up at the tops of trees in the forest that had been thrown up there by the tsunami. Uh, this, that's going to be something that the coastal communities are vastly more worried about than an increase in storm battering and, and a, a bit of ocean rise. One place where there clearly is a little bit of, I, I wouldn't, it's not exactly planned retreat geographically, but, but massive concern is in ocean acidification and, um, the shellfish industry and some of the other dependent communities here are trying to figure out what are we going to be doing as, as the things that constitute our livelihood cease to exist because of the increased acidity of, of the waters. Right. And I also would say just plan re- retreat could also be interpreted as, this, you know, maybe there's agricultural industries around where you're at that need to just transition in, into other industries just because of how you're going to be sustaining those cities. So, yeah, I think it's going to take many forms. Yeah. My last question, or not necessarily a question, is that I, I think I'm going to get a chance to meet you in person. You're attending the Earth Optimism Summit, right? I am. I'm actually going to be covering it as media. So I, I hope to meet you in person. <laughs> Uh, terrific. I, you know, the Earth Optimism Conference is, is an Earth Day event, so it will be taking place the day before Earth Day and mm-hmm. on Earth Day, both of which times I'm going to be out on the mall uh, a few hundred yards away from the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. But I'm talking there on the final day of it on April 23rd, so I, I would love to see you there. Well, I actually had on my previous podcast last week, Dr. Nancy Knowlton, and she came on and talked all about the Optimism Summit. So I think your uh-huh. panel is from the trenches. Can you just give a little uh, primer of what you might talk about? Well, it's, it's a pretty diverse panel that has some uh, some distinguished scholars and some people who have been inside the federal government. Uh, Jane Lubchenco, who mm-hmm. ran NOAA and is a professor at Oregon State University and a great marine scientist will be one of them. And, and it, it means different things. In, in the case of my talk, it will be the trenches of organizing what's going on politically. What did we do in 1970 that was unique and different in American politics that made it possible over the course of the following eight or nine years to um, to pass a wave of legislation that I'm going to argue is the most fundamental change in the nature of capitalism in the United States since the New Deal. The, the, the changes that came out of those laws have probably yielded on the order of 30, 35 uh, trillion dollars of benefits to the American economy and have fundamentally changed the way that we do business. And so mine is going to be just a, a conversation about, okay, what did the unique circumstances of that time make it possible for us to do to capitalize on it. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. And I, as I had mentioned to Nancy, it's kind of a crazy set of timing that, you know, that science march came out of nowhere. And so they've had to sort of work around that. But we, we sort of came to the conclusion it's probably a, a great thing for for the, the summit that all these people are going to be around. Yes, and, and vice versa. Several people who are speaking at, at the summit are going to be over at the, the science march as well. The, the reason that that's on Earth Day is, is just that, well, there, there are lots of reasons, but the dominant one is the early things that were being done. I mean, now that Trump has put in his budget and we see what he's intending to do to the National Institutes of Health and what he's intending to do to all kinds of research agencies, um, it, it is a, a broader set of concerns. But the early things were stripping climate change out of websites, uh, bringing in a climate denier to head the EPA, requiring that people who've completed studies run them past an ideological screen at the OMB before they even submit them for peer-reviewed journals, uh, directing the Army Corps of Engineers to change environmental impact statements to let projects go forward, Bas- basically a repudiation of core science. And more than any other movement in American history, the environmental movement has been built upon good science. So it was kind of natural if you're going to have a march on science to, to do it on Earth Day. Only silver lighting I see in all that. And I all that is terrible. But sometimes when you have people agreeing with you, maybe with the Obama administration, you, you get a complacent as a movement. So I hope what is happening now is just you're seeing these grassroots things pop up. And I'm encouraged by that. As you should be. And, and, and there is a great pendulum in American politics that the farther you pull it in one direction, the more that it tends eventually to swing in the other direction. 
But don't be too sanguine about it. I mean, we are now in the unexpected position of having anti-science and anti-environmental people dominating the executive branch of government, both houses of Congress, and much of the American judiciary. Uh, it's pretty difficult to figure out where you're going to get purchase. And so we, as, as we, we, we need to be aroused, motivated, mobilized, and we've got to change that circumstance. This has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, I appreciate your time. I, I just, first of all, just want to say thanks. You're, you're part of environmental history, and I hope you continue to be. I just, all of us look to some of the things that have happened since 1970. And so thank you for, for your service in that respect. But thanks again for coming on the podcast. It was a pleasure, Doug. Take care. All right, everyone. This is America Daps. Hey, Adapters. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dennis. Coming up now is Bill McKibben. 350.org. On today's very special episode, this is very special for me. I have legendary environmentalist, founder of 350.org, and someone identified as one of the top 100 most important global thinkers. And of course, I'm talking about Bill McKibben. Welcome to the podcast, Bill. Hey, a pleasure to be with you, Doug. Bill, again, I, I'm just in, is enthusiastic that you're here. I'm just kind of speechless in some ways, and I guess I, I can't be as a podcaster. But, you know, I just watched you on the Bill Maher show last week and just want to say how hilarious you were on that show. I don't know if that was the, your first time on the show. I'd done Bill Maher one time before. Well, I was just going to say how hilarious it was. I didn't realize there was – you kind of brought out all these sobering factoids on climate change, and yet your timing was sort of impeccable for these laughs. And I, I was really quite amazed that it, it was delivered with such humor, so I, it was really enjoyable to watch. Well, I'm glad. You know, those are the opportunities to try and kind of get the message out to large numbers of people. I think they've got an audience of about 5 million now, and we have to do a good job of the thing. Well, do you get a chance to sort of behind the scenes to talk with Bill Maher? And you, does he have a lot of questions for you? I mean, he I think it's been an important issue for him. It has. No, generally, it's all on the air. <laughs> Everybody's busy. So At one point, the, the camera was on both you and him, and he was sort of kind of lobbing you questions. And I just thought this would make for a great show like the McKibben and Maher Climate Hour. It was just really funny <laughs> delivery. Yeah, I'm glad People, I, I was getting all sorts of questions, getting preparation for you, and I just, you know, I want to start off kind of at the 30,000-foot level. There's a lot going on, and it's mostly bad. And I just want your advice on, like, what should we really be looking out for? I mean, we have to worry about the Paris Agreement, the EPA, the Dakota Access Pipeline. I mean, what are you focusing on? Well, I think at the 30-foot level, the question is, can the momentum that had begun to build in the direction of clean energy continue and accelerate, or is the advent of the Trump administration going to get decisively in the way of that? And I, I think that our job at the moment is to try and weaken the efforts of the Trump administration in the hopes that some of that momentum can continue. But I don't want to uh, spin it too for you. I think that this is a pretty devastating development, and it, you know, it was already an open question as to whether we were ever going to catch up with of climate change or not, and clearly we're not going to catch up as quickly as, as we could have. You've been, I mean, I've read a bunch of your articles, even during the Obama administration, you've been quite critical of President Obama, just he was on the climate side. And so I wonder if you see the fact that he does say those things on climate change, but we kind of get complacent. Is there potentially an opportunity that you can actually bring more urgency to the issue with someone like Trump in charge? Oh, well, yeah, in one sense, I guess, you know, it was hard work to get people to understand the Obama administration was not moving fast enough, which it wasn't. And it's certainly easier to get people to understand that because he's doing no moving at all. In fact, he's uh, jammed this tank into reverse. But I don't think that probably compensates for the damage that gets done. <laughs> I know it's three steps forward, four steps back. You know, there's been a lot of soul searching since the election. And, you know, this book, The Hillbilly Elegy, a lot of East Coasters are kind of getting that book out and trying to get inside the mind of a Trump voter. Do you think that's happening inside the climate change community? And do you think we should even try that approach? Well, uh, I think that probably on the climate issue, the best chance of uh, reaching out across partisan lines is less around climate. It's become a fully polarized issue in a lot of ways than it is around renewable energy. One of the 
curious things is that the polling data shows immense support for, say, solar power, uh, support that's about equally as strong among Republicans, independents, and Democrats. There's almost nothing for which else for which that's true. So I'd say that's a clue as to where to be looking at the moment. And just recently, a group of, I guess, senior Republicans brought out the idea of, of a carbon tax. Do you think there's any chance of any progress on that? I'd be doubtful that Trump is going to do anything about that. <laughs> I doubt it either. Bill, you, you're a legend in the climate change field. And so a lot of it has to uh, with the ability of your you know, how you communicate with folks. And so I have a buddy named Randy Olson who published a book on narrative structure and he created this narrative index and he applied it to you and you got one of the highest scores ever. And he's applied it to like Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King. And he called you a master of narrative power. I mean, why do you think you're such a great communicator? You said it was maybe your religious background. I don't think I'm that great a communicator, but I do think that the thing that I've been trying to get across these years is the most important and interesting and urgent um, piece of understanding that we have, this sense that the climate of the one planet we know supports life like ours is being compromised in a crazy way. And I think that repetition, you know, I've been doing this now for 30 years since I the first book about it all, uh, probably has something to do with that. And, of course, I, I've learned a great deal about all the things that don't really work that well. So through the process of elimination, perhaps I'm getting better at it. I've had Michael Mann on the podcast and Andy Revkin, and we talked about all these sort of climate battles over the last couple of decades. And, you know, some of us thought, you know, the worst was behind us. and But then it came up that maybe actually we are just at the beginning of some of these battles. And I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, Um the, the planet is changing with such enormous speed, and that changes the ground rule all the time. And it, it makes it more difficult. What I mean is that, you know, 28, 29 years ago when I was writing The End of Nature, it was a reasonable, it was reasonable to think that relatively small changes, a, a serious price on carbon, could have prevented uh, enormous damage. A quarter century later, we're at the point where the change we need now, because we've done nothing in the past, is so great. Those small changes no longer by themselves are, are sufficient. And so the thing that worries me is that we get deeper in this sort of deficit with the asking year. And the, <laughs> I worry that we're going to be ready to take 1980, you know, not 1996 levels of commitment. Uh, right about, you know, 2020 when those no longer make much sense. Well, this is an issue we'll be dealing with for decades, but there is that kind of rhetoric that if we don't turn the corner in the next eight years or the next 10 years, at some point we're going to hit that 10 year mark. And so how do, does a climate activist kind of keep going at that point? Well, I mean, the truth is that it's all, you know, it, it's not as if climate is a binary function where mm. You know, for, it's all great and then it's all terrible uh, past some certain point. Two degrees, for instance, is an important benchmark. Uh, a lot of scientific reason to think that one and a half or two degrees Celsius takes us into very dangerous, very, very dangerous territory. But there's no one who won't tell you that three degrees will be a lot worse than two degrees and Four, a lot worse than three, and probably not in linear fashion either, probably in some fairly exponential fashion. So the, there's always going to be reason to keep fighting. I guess I think that the work that we're doing now is simply to preserve the possibility that people can keep fighting in the future. Uh, you know, I look around at the young people who dominate the climate movement and think, my job is to try and keep a lot of possibility that they can keep this fight going on. I think that's the best we can hope for at this point. Well, that was one of the questions I had. A, a lot of my guests come on and they deal on the adaptation side of climate change. How do we adapt? Because, you know, we're seeing those impacts now. And so there's quite a, a robust culture of people adapting to climate change. And yet there's been some friction that 
people think that if you focus on adaptation, you're kind of giving up on mitigation. And I would disagree with that, but I'm just curious your thoughts. Do you think emphasizing adaptation at all is just a, a bad strategy? No, I, I mean, look, I, I think that I think that the emerging climate science of the last three or four years is a lot better than what we've encountered even before then. And what I mean by that is that what it looks like now is that without significant the changes that we're facing in the future are so large that adaptation becomes all but impossible in any meaningful way. That is to say, if when we when we thought we were looking at a half a meter or a meter of sea level rise, that's one thing. It's an entirely different thing to be looking at three, four, five, six meters of sea level rise in the foreseeable future. And so I think it actually means that the most important adaptation we can do is a lot more mitigation in an effort to slow those changes. I guess my mantra is my mantra is something like adapt to that which you can't prevent. And there's clearly changes that have happened that we need to adapt to, but prevent that at all costs to which you can't adapt. And and I think that's more powerfully the situation we're in right now. It's all right if I use that quote. I love that quote. I haven't heard that before. So I think it encapsulates what people in that adaptation are doing very well. There is just that sense like if people don't get mitigation down, there's no point. We keep digging that hole. So, yeah. Exactly right. Next steps. We, I mean, it's been. It seems like he's been pre- President Trump's been president for years now. It, you know, each week something new and horrible. But I'm, it, <laughs> we're leading up to something. And you had mentioned this on Bill Maher, and you know, we had the science march coming up. But just a week later, there's the climate march. And I was just hoping you could share a little bit about w- what that is and what you know what we're trying to accomplish with that march. Well, it's a big gathering in D.C. on April 29, which we hope people will come to. I think it'll be sort of like the one we did in New York. Ooh, going on three years ago now. Um, and the point is pretty basic. Uh, it's simply there is a large coterie of Americans who want action on climate change. You get 400,000 people together in a spot, you know, subtlety and nuance get lost a little bit, but climate change is real and stop playing games with it. And B, we have an enormous opportunity here. You know, the price of a solar dropped 80% in the last decade, which means that if we wanted to take action, we could. And in the course of that action, among other things, we'd kick off an extraordinary economic burst. I think that, you know, there will be a lot of labor people on hand, and I think that's one of the messages they'll really be bringing. If you're serious about jobs, then one be serious about is uh, our transition. Um, so is that being coordinated with sort of international events, too? Are you trying to get this all over the world? This one's mostly focused on the U.S. <laughs> this is, it'll be the hundredth day of Trump's administration. And I agree with you. It seems like it's been 10 years already. Uh, one of the underappreciated virtues of former presidents, it turns out, was that you could forget about them for days at a time. Um, but so yeah, I've already got gray hair just, if, you know, two weeks in, but are you guys coordinating? I mean, I, I don't know how involved you are with the planning of it, but it, you know, I know the science marches before that. And, you know, there's a lot of overlap in the sense that a lot of. Yes, no, it's very good. I think that the science march doesn't want wants to do their own thing, which mm-hmm. is good. And so around the country that weekend, the focus will be on really on uh, fact, you know, that's the weekend of fact. And there'll be teach ins all over the place and we'll be helping with that. And then it moves a week later into action because uh, uh, the scientists are, are don't want to be too political in their work, you know, and too much. Ad- um, so we'll do that the next week. Well, I'm based in the D.C. area. I will definitely be out doing micro podcasts with folks during that climate march. I'm looking forward to being part of that exciting event. Bill, I also want to talk about. What can individuals do? I hear from people all the time that they contact me, and these are not even people in the climate change universe, and they're, they they ask, like, what can you know I do at my level? And I'm sure you get that all the time. And oh, I'm sh- what, do you, what do you do? Yes. No, the answer, I think, is the answer is simple. And it, like everything else, it depends on understanding where we are physically. You know, in an ideal world where we had plenty of time to change, then the answer to that would be take personal action at home and kind of educate the next generation about what needs to happen and so on. That would be good. And 
people are doing that. You know, we're changing our light bulb, putting up solar panels and things. You know, it would be nice if that's how the world was going to change because humans change best at that kind of pace. Sadly, we lack the time for that. We had to start 25 years ago if we were going to catch up with physics. We waited way too long. So now what we need more than individual action is collective action, i.e. politics. We need people taking what energy and time they have and using it to organize, to be pushing for big political change, whether it's a price on carbon in the ground strategy for fossil fuel, a divestment from fossil fuel at their local institutions, on and on down the, the list. If you have some energy left over after that, by all means, change your light bulb because that's important too. Well, so is there, you think there will be a strategy coming out of that march? I mean, will the big thing be like, okay, let's focus on the 2018 elections? I mean, you'd mentioned all these other things, but it, you think, is there already talk on what the specific actions might be out of that march? People are already thinking about the 2018 elections, I know, but I, I doubt there'll be any one single strategy. This is a big enough problem that we need to be working on a bunch of fronts at once. But there have been so many bad things that have happened in, in this first six weeks, and I'm just curious, and you've been involved with this. At some point, you know, there's these things that we can do as citizens, but uh, I wonder, with four years of Trump, that do you see civil disobedience kind of kicking in that it never really did with in, during the Obama years? I mean, do you think that's sort of likely to happen? I don't know. I, I uh, One of the problems that we're now with Trump is that he's precipitating so many crises at once that it's difficult for us, for everyone to react all of them at the same time. You know what I mean? And there are things that are even more immediate than the climate crisis, you know, staring us down as people get separated from their children and deported as uh, uh, just one horror after another. Um, so figure out how to deal with all these things as best we can. Right. Obviously, the climate change is this big major issue for us. And of course, I think it's the biggest issue in the world for obvious reasons. But then competing against all these other major, more, I guess, immediate issues. Yeah. By far the biggest thing that's going on in the world every day. Um, the problem is that every day there's something more immediate going on, you know, and so that makes the organizing difficult, but not impossible. And Mother Nature is doing her best now to remind us regularly of exactly the folly that we're engaged in. Do you feel like there's any sort of catalyst event? Will it be another uh, natural event that might kind of shift public opinion? I don't know. I mean, it's worth remembering that it was Hurricane Katrina, even more than the war in Iraq that brought down George W. Bush. Um, I shudder to think about what the response of the federal government will be, you know, given its current disorganized configuration if we do hit trouble, you know, when we hit trouble. You know, Bill, uh, a lot of sobering in information out there, but I'm just wondering if just – is there a positive message that we can kind of leave listeners with? I mean, obviously, this is a dire situation. The positive is, the positive is that there really is a resistance rising. You know, the planet's running a fever. We are the antibodies, and we'll see if we're kicking in in time or not. <laughs> it's an open question at this point, but thank God there are a lot of people stepping up. Uh, we did a long time to get started, but now we're starting. we'll see if we fight this out the fossil fuel industry. And, Bill, one last question I ask all my uh, guests is that, is there a future guest that you would recommend that I could interview on the podcast? Oh, there are so many. List people for... Uh, a uh, month and a half, but uh, <laughs> if I were you, I'd talk to a young man named Anthony Rogers Wright, who I think has been doing terrific and interesting work at Environmental Action, and uh, I think your listeners will enjoy talking to him. Excellent. I'll look him up. I'll try to track him down, and I'll say <laughs> you recommended him. All right. Take care, brother. Great pleasure for me, too. All right. Thank you so much. It's a huge honor. I appreciate you coming on. Good luck. Hey, folks, that is a wrap for this week's episode of America Daps. Many thanks to Bill McKibben and for to Dennis Hayes for coming on. It was truly an honor to have them come on the podcast and talk about these very important issues. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of bad things happening in the news. I hope to keep focusing on these issues on this podcast, and I hope to hear from you. I say this every time. Go to my website, americadaps.org. You can contact me. I'd love to hear from you, what you think of the podcast, ideas for guests, or just share your thoughts. And don't forget, I have a Facebook page and a community group that you can join. Just search for America Daps and you'll find it. 
and please join. Uh, there's a vibrant conversation that occurs in that community group. I'm also on Twitter at USA Adapts. Please tweet me and please consider sharing this episode. This is, a, I think, a very important episode for the Times. Share it on your Facebook page. Tweet about it. Let's get the word out and let's get inspired by what both Dennis and Bill have to say about these issues. They need, they're leaders and we, we should follow and we have a lot to learn from them. Again, next week, I have Judge Alice Hill coming on the podcast. I'm very excited about that. In future episodes, I have Andrew Lewin from Speak Up for Blue. And I'm also going to be doing an episode on the National Adaptation Forum coming up in a few weeks. And so a full schedule for this spring. I'm getting geared up. I'll be recording live from the Science March and the Earth Optimism Summit and the week later, there will be the big climate change march. And based on what the actions that occurred under President Trump, that march is hopefully people will be coming out swinging. And I'm excited to get out there and interview people and have some great conversations. Again, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. You can go on iTunes and subscribe. Or if you're on an Android, use Stitcher, whatever you use, please consider subscribing so it shows up every week. And on that note, I want to thank you all again for listening. I, I love doing this podcast and you know having these conversations with all these amazing people. It, it really is an honor for me. And again, please share with your colleagues and your friends and let, let's get the word out and let's, let's create a movement here learning about climate change and then acting on doing something about it. All right. Thanks again, Adapters. Until next time, this is Doug Parsons with America Adapts.